Hey guys, John here from FlyAteMikeAlpha.com, and today we're going to go ahead and take a look at DME arcs. So what exactly is a DME arc, and how do you fly it? So for starters here, what is a DME arc? Well, ultimately, the purpose here of a DME arc is rather than just flying straight in on an ILS or localizer, it's for you to arrive at a station at a point and then fly outbound and fly an arcing path, so a nice curved airway basically, to get you established on a localizer or on some sort of approach inbound to the airport. So why do they do this? Well, typically because there's some sort of train between the airport and the outer portions of the approach and they need to have you navigate a different path around that. So it's really just for terrain separation most often or sometimes even airspace separation. The important things to note here about a DME arc is the arc itself is a published portion of the approach. Notice how the arc itself on this approach plate for the ILS or LOC runway 3 into SJT is bold. So it's a bold arc, meaning that's a published portion of the approach. Why is it being a published portion of the approach important to us? Well, because there's an altitude associated with it, and that altitude is 4,000. Say that you're told to descend and maintain 8,000 and cleared for the approach, proceed direct to the SJT VUR, and then outbound on the radial 135, cleared for the approach. Well, as you descend outbound, once you hit the arc, once you make that right turn from radial 135 and join that arc on the bottom of the approach plate here, that's a published portion of the approach. You can go ahead and start on down to 4,000 feet. In this example we're gonna give you here, we're already being vectored around at 4,000 feet. So we're simply going to fly to the station. We're flying towards the SJT VOR. And once we hit the VOR, we're gonna go ahead and make that right turn and twist our VOR CDIs or twist our OBS knobs over to 135. And we're gonna use both VOR receivers to back us up here. So we have both CDIs dialed in to 135 degrees Currently, we just have the bottom, VOR number two, taking us to the station, directly to it, on about a 040 heading, about the 220 radial, and we're going to the station. And we twist in 135 to the top CDI, to the top OBS knob there. We hit the station, we get that two from flag flip, and we're going to go ahead and twist our heading bug on over to 135 degrees and start flying outbound. Now, as we fly outbound on this radial, this is not a published portion of the approach because it's a thin, skinny line. It's just a directional line. It's telling us where we need to fly to, but it's not a published portion of the approach. So you don't want to start your descent yet. You got to get onto that thick black line first that has an altitude associated with it. So as we cruise out here on radial 135, we'll go ahead and speed up a little bit because it's going to take forever. We are going to be looking at the DME, the distance, off the SJTVOR. And we look here on our Garmin 530 that we have here on the right, it's showing us what radial we're on as we're rolling around here from the SJTVOR and our distance. So we're going to go ahead and take a little bit of a bite here. We're going to twist over to about a 140 heading, maybe 145 heading. That'll help us get back onto that 135 radial. So we're 135 from the station, as we can see on both of our VOR receivers here, both of our uh, OBS knobs are set to 135. Our CDIs are slowly coming in, being centered. And as we get outbound here, we see 11, 12 DME. Now, remember, DME has slant range error. So if you're getting true DME off of the station, off the SJTVOR, there's slant range error associated with it compared to using the DME from just your GPS. Not a big deal. Totally fine to use the DME off the GPS or the VOR because slant range error at 15 miles from the station and 4,000 feet is totally negligible. We're not worried about it. Now, as we come up to 15 DME here, we're gonna go ahead and spin our heading bug around, start that right hand turn, because we're gonna overshoot a little bit if we wait till we actually see 15.0. So we'll start about 0.2 prior, 0.2 nautical miles prior, spin that around 90 degrees, okay? So we were heading about 135 outbound. Now we're gonna spin that around 90 degrees to a 225 heading. And we can go ahead and twist our OBS knobs 10 degrees over, so from the 135 heading over to a 145 heading. And the reason for that is we're gonna have that CDI needle slowly become centered as we fly closer to the 145 radial. So we came out on the 135 radial, now we're going to be flying towards the 145 radial on this heading at 225. We overshot a little bit here, we're 15 and a half miles from the station, so we're gonna go ahead and maybe fly a heading about 230, 235 now, help us get a little bit back there. Always making small corrections, 10, 20 degrees, never more than that to correct. So 10 degree corrections is great to start with, trying to keep the DME relatively close to 15 there. 
As we see, our VOR number two here is becoming centered. It's slowly coming in, showing us that we're slowly getting towards the 145 radial. As we hit that 145 radial, we'll go ahead and turn our heading bug again. We'll twist another 10 degrees to the right, and then we'll twist our OBS knob to move our CDI another 10 degrees. So we'll go over to a 155 setting on the VOR number two to have that CDI deflected again. And then we'll start flying towards the 155 radial all while making this curving flight path. And it's not a steady turn here. It's just turn 10 degrees, fly level. And then twist 10 degrees, turn 10 degrees, fly level. And so it's just turn 10, twist 10, turn 10, twist 10, constantly all the way around. And that'll basically keep you relatively close to that 15.0 DME that we're aiming for. We can see here we're 15.4. So we can keep bumping our heading a little bit over to the right, five degree, 10 degree corrections. Typically we like to say that if you're a half mile off, 10 to 20 degrees is plenty. Now, of course, you have to account for wind drift here. And so with the winds aloft, things are going to change and the heading you want is going to change slightly. But that's where just judging how quickly you're getting closer to the station or further away from it comes into play. So you just have to see, keep watching that DME 15.2 and staying relatively constant. It's not going 15.2, 15.1, 15, 14, 9, 14, 8. Then clearly you're aimed too close to the station. You need to kind of twist your heading bug a little away from the station or just fly straight and level for a little while. Eventually you'll get further away from it when you maintain that heading. So as we fly around this arc here, it's just turn 10, twist 10. We keep doing that all the way around until we get to about that final 10 degrees. So we have about a 034 inbound course. And with that 034 inbound course, we could say roughly that would be the 224 radial from the station. So about 215 would be our last 10 degree segment. And as we enter into that last 10 degree segment, we're going to have to start thinking about making another 90 degree right turn to join the localizer course. And as we come around to go ahead and join that localizer course, we're going to get one of our receivers tuned up to the localizer. So since this is an ILS, I'd like to tune up our nav one. So where we have the SJTVR dialed in right now, we'll go ahead and just press the flip flop key. We'll swap 115.1 and 109.7. So we get 109.7 in the active. We start receiving the localizer and the glide slope. And at roughly five degrees prior to getting there, so roughly about a 220 radial from the station, since we said 224 is where we're going to be flying our inbound course. So roughly about five degrees prior is where you want to start that right hand turn, 90 degrees to the right, to join up on the localizer here. Now, in this little simulation here, I started a little bit early. I started about maybe seven or eight degrees before. Starting five degrees before is pretty good. You don't want to overshoot. Better to undershoot a little bit and then correct for it than overshoot and have to chase yourself back and risk making a steeper turn than you want to, especially when you're flying under IFR. But typically when you're at speeds of less than 150 knots ground speed, then you can simply just wait till you're five degrees prior to the inbound course and then make that right 90 degree turn to start following the localizer inbound. And then, of course, once you hit the glide slope intercept, you'll start following the glide slope on down. The biggest mistakes with DME arcs is people making too big a corrections. So making 20, 30, 40 degree heading changes, trying to chase that DME, trying to keep it near that 15.0 or whatever the plate says. And also using the DME off the wrong fix, using the DME off the airport, instead of in this case, they want us to use it off the VOR. And we know they want us to use it off the VOR because it says so right on the arc, right on the published portion of the approach. It says SJT. 15 in that little circle thing, meaning 15 DME arc. And then above that, we see the 4,000 no PT, meaning fly this arc at 4,000 feet, no lower, and no procedure turn upon reaching the localizer. You just make the 90 degree turn inbound. Don't make the procedure turn, don't turn outbound. That's really all there is to DME arcs. They're fairly simple. People get a little freaked out by them just because they start chasing their heading too much and they start getting a little too far off on the DME. Smaller changes, being patient, realizing that you're making a big wide arcing turn you don't need fast quick heading changes you don't want to people often turn inbound way too much and get way too close to the station and the whole purpose of this arc is to keep you away from the airport away from the station because there's terrain and in this case we can see we have a little tower between us and the airport at 2864 feet that's what we're trying to avoid so we don't want to turn too close to it so it is important to note here that we do have these little things lr207 lr224 those are lead radials, or the suggested place that you start your turn inbound when you're coming in on the arc. Now, the trouble is, in such a slow airplane like a Cessna or a Piper, that's probably a little early for you to start your turn inbound. So that's why I like using that five degree rough rule of thumb. And we can see on this particular approach, there's lots of ways for us to avoid that terrain, right? So we could go ahead and go to child and then head to the locator outer marker, the initial approach fix of Wooly. We could go to Edward 
and head at 4,000 feet over to that locator outer marker. We could start off at tanker and head inbound. That'll avoid the train at 2,056 feet and avoid the tower at 2,692 feet. That's the whole purpose here. The DME arc is avoiding terrain, possibly avoiding some air space, but definitely avoiding terrain and obstacles. Always be sure you're tuning in the right station, like we said before, and identifying it, right? So we can see on our Garmin 530, it says SGT, it identified it for us because it hears the Morse code and it tells us what it's hearing. But we, if we don't have that phone feature in our airplane or it doesn't work that day, you need to manually tune in, listen to the Morse code and positively ID the station so you know that you're receiving the right station, both for the localizer and for the SJTVOR, since that's what you're using your DME off of and using the radials to fly outbound initially. If you have any questions on this at all, leave them in the comments below or even better yet, go ahead and post your questions in the online IFR forums at flyatmikealpha.com. This video is part of our online instrument pilot ground school, full A to Z, zero to hero, online at flyatmikealpha.com. We guarantee if you know nothing about instruments, we will take you to everything you need to know and guarantee that you will pass your instrument pilot check ride. And even if you already are an instrument rated pilot and you just want to brush up on those skills, go ahead and check out the course. It has over 200 awesome videos in there, over 20 accident case studies, and plenty of great real world scenarios to help you train and help you expand and improve your instrument flying skills. If you're already an instrument rated pilot, we guarantee you will learn something new when taking the course. Also be sure to check out all the other awesome, helpful online courses at flyatmikealpha.com. And if you can't fly every day, then just fly at mikealpha.com. We'll see y'all next time.